very good evening to each one of you who has joined us today. And I, Professor Mahesh Bangad, on behalf of the TDB team, welcome all of you to the second session of the Triangle Lecture Series 2021. It is an honor to be a part of the team and it is my duty to tell you about the initiative. The drawing board, as you, most of you know, is an international architecture competition a platform that is provided to students based in India, where students can test their understanding and skills in shaping the way communities live and thrive while preserving the local heritage of the place. It is also important to uh, look at why this was conceptualized. This, uh, the TDB initiative was conceptualized by Mindspace Architects and Rowan Builders in 2016 to provide the architecture students with an opportunity to explore uh, real-life de design challenges and that too in real locations, which makes it very interesting because the endeavor is to create a unique space for conversations and to bring together students, professionals and ideas on a common platform. It also helps instigate thoughtful research by design by also suggesting tangible issues on architectural and contextual uh, designs in each cycle. Posted annually, once in the Oxford of the uh, East, Pune City, the competition finale itself is a one-day gala affair where eminent jury members guide students and eventually help them become the responsible architects that we wish them to be. Unfortunately, this year too, uh, the times because they have been testing and due to the pandemic, uh, we have been unable to do this event offline. Uh, we decided to go online and not stop at uh, uh, this year in the sixth edition. We have been hosting all our activities online and we'll be hosting the finale as well on the 24th, that is Friday. So I would request you to mark a calendar for the same. With this, we are also hopeful that next year the TDB will be offline and in person and the event will be larger and uh, bigger than ever before. Before I formally begin, I want to thank all the ecosystem partners that have been providing us unending support from, from the fraternity and have been taking us uh, to reach out to the corners of the world. I would like to thank our partners for, for this edition, starting with Matter from Goa, who are our publication partners. You can go online on the TDP website and check the annual publication. It's a wonderful publication and also a guide for you to know how winning competitions is easy by participating. Mashal NGO and the contribution of our beloved mentor, late architect Sharad Mahajan, cannot be uh, left out. I wish he was here with us attending this session uh, and he would have been totally proud of the way the students have participated in the competition. I want to thank Amazing Architecture, the Levadis, Archie Voice, Competitions.Archi, Architecture Live, and also Archidiaries. Your support is forever needed. Now I'll quickly tell you a little about the TDB challenge and uh, why it was initiated uh, this year uh, with the idea of understanding and taking pride in Maharashtra's 800 year old tradition called Wari, which involves a journey to a significant place from a religious, of a religious importance. And this is carried on foot. Drone builders and mind space architects are known to contribute to, through design and build initiatives that are always pro society. And like each year, they have taken up a relevant issue of providing facilities for these workeries as the brief for the sixth edition of the drawing board competition. The intent of the organizers was clear to give the students the necessary exposure and opportunity to deal with a real life scenario and explore design solutions that could solve long term problems while designing with empathy. The drawing board 2021 has received tremendous response this year. Congratulations to all the nine finalists and a thank you to all the 700 plus students that registered from the 20 plus countries. What has made it even more special is the jury members we have this year. I take this opportunity to thank each one of them for having been so kind to take this humongous task of evaluating such wonderful entries and doing justice to each one of them. Thank you, architect Rupali Gupte, architect Neil Kanchaya, and architect Peter Strachbari. The TDB lecture series. With the objective of doing more for the students and providing them better insights into the architectural works of our jurors and their viewpoints, the drawing board lecture series was launched last year. We have requested each of our three jury members to make talks and presentations for the students and present their architectural journey and the inspirational work they do. 
we at TDB are really obliged to each one of them for having kindly agreed to do so. Thus, without wasting much time now, I will introduce our speaker for the day, architect Neil Kanchaya. For us, in architectural teaching, he is a guru, of course, uh, but his practice journey from Nairobi, Kenya, since 1975 to 82. After that, Chaya sir moved base from Africa to India. He started Mandala Design Services in Vadodara with partners Kalol Joshi and Sohan Nilkan. He retired in the year 2013 as the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, SEP Ahmedabad, after a 24-year teaching sojourn at the school. I welcome you, sir, and it's a privilege to have you here. To start with, uh, I just have a quick question, and as a teacher, I think uh, uh, it is uh, very uh, obvious of it, me, uh, it to come to me. With the increasing number of opportunities to diversify, do you think architecture as a base degree will give an additional edge to the young students while choosing their stream of work in future or the times to come? Yes, certainly, because unlike uh, so many other fields of academic uh, endeavor, it does not, architecture does not try to streamline you into a single uh, well-defined area of work. What it does on the other side is to open you up to all the complexities of life which affect architecture, which affect the way society moves and which uh, will then give you a peep into the various arts, into the humanities, into technologies. And it's then quite possible for an architect to very easily um, start swimming mid-current into the next tree. So that's very good. Uh, thank you for certainly putting it that way. Uh, I think, yes, uh, the whole idea of uh, switching currents and yet uh, going back to the mainstream will be interesting for all architecture students in future as well. So I would now request you to uh, begin with your talk about moving over the land and we look forward to getting mesmerized by your thoughts. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I, you know, when I was asked to give this talk, when I was given the competition, uh, what it was all about, I was fascinated. Because some years ago, I happened to be in Pune and was moving around at somewhere near the edges of Pune. And I saw the Varkaris. Uh, and I was deeply impressed and moved by this group of people who I found out walk from where they are from to Pandharpur. And they sing and dance and make food and eat it as they are on the way. And they are, as I found out more about that group, I was even more moved because of all the religious traditions, this is the one which seems to break the divisions, uh, does not accept societal hierarchies and does not ask you to leave the world but only to do the pilgrimage as often as possible and keep your own life, your worldly life in order, in, in a kind of a ethical framework. So to me, this was quite an amazing thing to have happened uh, in Maharashtra so long ago. And so I thought, instead of talking about my work or my journey, let's talk about their journey because it's something which is uh, from which we could learn a lot. So the figure of the pilgrim is something which has, which has been important in most cultures. The pilgrim leaves home in the search of uh, joining something larger than himself or herself, becoming part of something which is uh, 
which unites uh, with, with the whole existence. And this has been, in, I think, in all traditions. The Australian um, Aborigines do it, the Europeans had it, and the Christian faith had it. Um, in India, we have it. In Islam, you have it. And you have it all over the world. The idea that leaving home is an act of searching. So in that sense, it connects completely or in very straightforward terms to the field of architecture. Because let us remember what Aldo Van Eyck said. And he said, architecture need do no more, nor should it ever do less than assist man's homecoming. So architecture is something with which we assist the human to come back home. What is this homecoming? What is this home? And it might be well to ask the Varkari, what is the home? They have a home. And that home is the place of being upright, being uh, mindful of what one does to the world, doing the minimum damage. That is part of the Varkari's uh, ethos. But also home means, home in, in many cultures, but especially in, in the culture of the Varkaris, it means the place of hospitality. For all of India, Atithi, the unexpected guest, is the meaning of home. If you can only call yourself a Grihastha, that means the holder of a home, you can only call yourself a Grihastha, if you are hospitable, if you give shelter, food, etc., to any person who comes to you. Now, this is a wonderful notion of a home, which we will talk about a little bit. Because we, in talking about architecture, I think we begin with talking about the home, because that is the base from which all institutions of man evolve. So we'll talk about it in a minute. But let's look at this circle of the Varkaris. Leave home, go on a journey, reach the Tirtha or the place of crossing. Tirtha is the place where you cross to the other side. So that's a very meaningful word as well. So reach the Tirtha, go back home. So what is it? Home, the place where you are hospitable, where you can, you can welcome guests, where your home is opened up to anyone and everyone. The most unexpected ones, it's open. Your home, your food is open. And then on the journey, now that's very interesting, because on the journey, the world is hosting you. The villages that you pass through, you will need their water. You might take some shelter somewhere in their temple or in some kind of uh, space that they have. And very often, the villagers will offer their hospitality to the Varkaris. So you got, you were the people who offered hospitality. Now you are the people who accept hospitality, and then you reach the Tirtha. So, not just giving, but receiving. What does that mean? That means that this whole action of this life belongs to the commons, belongs to the idea that 
all of humanity and all of living creatures, everything on the earth is, uh, is hosted by the earth and is um, supported and is uh, the hospitality of the earth is what we uh, are grateful for. So the, that means in short, that the whole idea of the ownership of property becomes very little of very little importance. Home is not the place which you say, oh yes, this is mine and I paid so much for it and there it is and I lock it up and I won't let anybody come in. No, that's not home. That's only a box. Home is where you say, oh yes, come in. So ownership is not important. Social identity to the worker is, is not important. You could be of any caste, you could be anybody, but if you need hospitality, then you will be offered. So that the joining of the Sangha, the group of people who are walking, that joining with them is not uh, an individual act, it is a re re reduction of personal identity. It is a melting into something larger. So this is a very, very interesting set of ideas. And the home, what will be the home like? The home will be open, first of all, because you want to receive. You want to keep it open. You want to welcome people. So the home will be open and welcoming. It will not be a place of secrecy and privacy and security. It will be a place of openness and sharing. So you will sit uh, on the street at times. You will sit from where anybody can watch you. And you will be doing your life's work as you go along. So the the idea that the home is somewhere where you can lock yourself in and the world is out, the line where the world is on one side and you and your home are on the other side, that's not there. So the home has a specific type of architecture in the period of hospitality. That it is open, it is incomplete, its boundary is not complete, it is opened up at points. It allows the air, the birds, the, even the cows, perhaps, to walk through. And it is permeable. So then the architecture takes a specific quality. It is the quality of permeability. It is the quality of, of uh, fragility that can change. It is the quality which says, Oh yes, things happen in life and new things will come, old things will go, but it's not so fixed, it's open. So it's the opposite of the closed box. It's a breathing thing. It is punctuated. The difference between the pure and the impure, inside and the outside, the known and the unknown, the safe and the dangerous, all those differences are not that sharply visible in the home. And this, I think, is the essence of the pilgrimage. The pilgrim's mindset opens the home because the world is also the home. The where I walk to is my home. And when I come back is also my home. And my home, I belong both to that bigger and also to this smaller. And both are my home. That is the idea of the pilgrim. What a wonderful sense. Now, with the coming of modern legal systems, uh, economic systems, perhaps the idea of home is changing. Suddenly from a receptacle which absorbed and opened and breathed, it now becomes the secure territory in which every family builds up its own capacities to survive in the world. It 
security, privacy, the uh, increase of prestige, status, wealth, and through that, the buildup of an identity because I need to be identified. This is something which, which replaces the question of the uncertain life of the host who is open to anybody, any atithi turning up at his door. So now you get the secure house. Let me read to you something which is said by Zygmunt Bauman, one of the very wonderful sociologists of our time, passed away. But he wrote an essay called From Pilgrim to Tourist. So he says about today's pilgrim, the poor guy who is trying to survive in this world, you know, he's just a pilgrim on this life's journey, which is so tough. So the pilgrim has a stake in the solidity of the world that they walk in. In a kind of world in which one can tell life as a continuous story, a sense-making story, such a story as make, makes each event the effect of the event before and the cause of the event after. So cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. What in India we call the Sansara Chakra. Each age, a station on the road pointing towards fulfillment. So you're a child, then you're a student, then you're a householder, etc. And you're going towards fulfillment. Of, but it's a tough struggle. And there's no time to, to be hospitable. The world of pilgrims, of identity builders, must be orderly, determined, predictable, ensured. But above all, it must be a kind of world in which footprints are engraved for good, so that the trace and record of the past travels are kept and preserved. A world in which traveling may be indeed a privilege. That's today's pilgrim, not the workery but the pilgrim who is the, who is the householder in today's time. Or today, just before today, actually. Because by today, we are into the postmodern age where nothing is certain. Uh, uh, uncertainty is everywhere. Things will change. And so you cannot have that kind of a secure existence. The secure existence where the commons had to disappear and the individual existence had to be a competitive thing. So now you have the time of the tourist. Because you don't know where you will live. You don't know what you will do. So get the mats out of your, your time on earth. So you become the tourist. And contrast the tourist to the, to the pilgrim, the workery pilgrim. So in the tourist's world, again, this is Bauman, in the tourist's world, the strange is tame, tamed, domesticated, and it no longer frightens. Shocks come in a package deal with safety. This makes the world seem infinitely gentle, obedient to the tourist's wishes and whims, ready to oblige, but also a do-it-yourself world, pleasingly pliable, needed by the tourist's desire, made and remade with one purpose in mind, to excite, please, and amuse. There is no other purpose to justify the presence of that world and the tourist's presence in it. The tourist's world is fully and exclusively structured by aesthetic criteria. Now, this, you might think, why am I talking about this? But this is exactly the state of our architecture today, that it is no longer connected to the, to the necessities of existence, but is only the provision of pleasure at any cost. And so it disjoints itself from the world. The pilgrim connects herself to the world the tourist disconnects and becomes a warrior of the world and can therefore do any kind of damage to the earth. And this is what our architecture is today, that it has to look good and it has to give pleasure 
at any cost and everything should be under control. Whatever technologies you need must be provided for this sense of control, for, for disallowing the, the uh, uncertainties of existence. And I wonder whether we have come to the end of a period here where the architecture is destroying the world rather than adding or becoming participant in the world. But if you have no money, instead of tourists, you have to become the vagabond. And what does the vagabond do? Zygmunt uh, Bauman says, wherever the vagabond goes, he's a stranger. He can never be the native, the settled one, one with roots in the soil. Too fresh is the memory of his arrival, that is, of his being elsewhere before. Entertaining a dream of going native can only end in mutual recrimination and bitterness. It is better, therefore, not to grow too accustomed to the place. And so, you have the world in which the tourists are trying to suck the maximum juice out of it, and the vagabonds are making whatever they make, whatever they can possibly do. Now you look at our cities, see the contrast between the tourists on the land who move from Bangalore to Ahmedabad to Pune to Calcutta to, as, as required, but they always have all the luxuries at their disposal. And look on the other side at the migrant. You know, this, this uh, person who works in the in the software industry is never called a migrant, even though he moves from place to place. It's only that one who doesn't have money, who doesn't have a house, who has to carry a sack rather than a briefcase. He's the person who is called the migrant. And so in today's world, either you have to make maximum advantage out of the world that exists, like the tourist, or you have to be the vagabond. And these two choices were the choices which were denied by the pilgrim. The pilgrim said, no, whatever life is, I accept that. If it means living with the minimum, I accept that. You look at the Varkari. But it also means that he says, with whatever I have, I have the generosity to be hospitable because I have a home. I have a place of, from which I spring out. And I will make the pilgrimage to go and see the world, to go and enjoy the world. But I will be deeply rooted in it. I will not be a warrior to the world. Unless we have the pilgrim, and the attitude of the pilgrim, we are going to have a world geography which is sharply cut into two parts. The part of reckless pleasure and the part of suffering for no reason at all. Architecture has something to do with this. What is the architecture that we make? How much does the architecture open itself? How much does it allow the processes of life to play out rather than control them? Is it a sealed box? If not a sealed box, is it made wonderfully with generosity and love to be the vessel of hospitality. With that, I will leave you to see what you might think about your own project. Because you will have designed something for the workers. Whether you have caught the spirit of the pilgrim in it, or you have imposed the spirit of the current times of tourism or of 
austerity without without uh, joy what will this architecture be like can we be somehow connected to the mind and heart of the pilgrim this is something which this competition could have awakened in you and i hope it has and i thank the drawing board for putting forward this as the competition in which you took part thank you very much ah uh, thank you so much uh, sir uh, it was uh, a symphony actually uh, you bonded three things uh, together into your uh, talk and you spoke about vagabonds tourists and the pilgrims and uh, we have a question immediately in our uh, chat box which i think is obvious and which came to my mind also so uh, do you think uh, we are all three uh, during our journey of our life as designers at some point are we vagabonds and some points are we tourists and do we want to end it as pilgrims no i think the beginning we should want to begin as as pilgrims a uh, pilgrim doesn't mean somebody who has given up the world and who is not uh, you know who is doing his bhajan as he goes along uh, a pilgrim is one who is looking for the real for the actual and so first of all we are all pilgrims when we are a little tired we could be a bit of a tourist but we should we should try to make that the minimum because we are doing something to the world every tourist uh, should bear in mind that it is at the expense of the world and it's at the expense of the other people that tourism is possible those who shot off into space and came back four days ago or two days ago i would ask, like to ask them the question whether they He really took care of so many other things in the world. So tourism, yes, we can um, relax with a little bit of it, but the the pilgrim's eye is sharp, and his passion to know, and his passion to connect, and to offer hospitality is great. Vagabonds. if we are forced to use vagabondage at some point in time all right but we should be aware that this is a societal injustice which is going on and so if we need to be pilgrims who fight that so be it so the pilgrim uh, will not turn into the vagabond easily will not be a tourist very easily may have some weak moments as all of us do but by and large the tourist or the vagabond cannot enter the heart space of the of the pilgrim yes you can go and ask ask it to a varkari and we'll find out <laughs> Uh, i received a comment from nupur she says uh, tourist uh, do not really associate with, uh, with one place uh, but pilgrims always have the roots to go back to and that is uh, the difference i think uh, between the tourist and pilgrims but she says uh, both affect uh, the surroundings one probably positive and one probably using up the positivity mm. so Yeah. what is your take i think uh, personally i feel when pilgrims uh, travel from one place to another they are giving out that positivity that kind of uh, to uh, that kind of aura that needs to be uh, going from one place to another do you uh, do you think uh, that is, makes sense yeah one has to be very careful about this uh, today with the media and the spread of the attractiveness of certain images even the pilgrimage can become something which is a corrupt existence just imagine for example the kavad yatra there so much violence happens in up on that yatra 
or I have been observing the Ganesh Visarjan, um, you know, parades and the amount of bad behavior that one observes of violence, of not being um, cognizant of others' lives, all of that. So that means that it is possible to have the outward look of a pilgrim, but become internally a vagabond or a tourist. And so one has to be really careful that the most important thing about the pilgrim is the journey of going inwards and crossing and crossing and which means a certain way of living which is which is of friendship and hospitality and i think this is something which uh, is something which we need to bring back from the pilgrim Yes, uh, there's another comment from uh, one of the uh, attendees. Uh, she says, uh, the town could be also seen as a large family that the town tries to accommodate within. The town of Pandalpur itself is a large home. And when that calls you, then that pilgrimage association, I think, uh, makes more sense. On that note, I also want to understand, uh, when, you, when we talk about friendships and uh, hospitality, uh, I think uh, this uh, camaraderie that gets uh, developed between the pilgrims is unmatchable. Uh, you don't find uh, the same camaraderie between tourists, maybe. Uh, could, you, uh, could, you, could you highlight through architecture, how could we contribute towards increasing this camaraderie? So first of all, I think the permeability of of space. For example, if you move through one of those towns uh, where the pilgrimage moves through, it's not just in Maharashtra, it's all over the country, it is there. The houses which open onto that street, they bring out, they come out and put water and food and all kinds. I've even seen that some of them give a massage to the tired pilgrims, you know, so they put charpais and so that the whole space of the town becomes permeable and there is no gated enclosure. So now what we have done in our recent cities is to make gated ghettos more or less, that a certain economic class will be only within that and at night they can close the gate and feel somewhat secure, but they lose out on the ability to give hospitality. And I think this is something which is a feature of our urban fabrics that is, that is changing, where the vehicle becomes more important than the human and the doors do not open. If I walk through any of the older towns, all the main doors are open. And I, if I am a little nosy, I can get a glimpse of what is going on inside. Of course, my uh, natural sort of uh, uh, good, polite behavior prevents me from staring. But I get a sense of the life as I walk the streets. Now, today, you go on a street and there is no life. And you only have impressive facades of the boxes in which people have retreated. This is where the difference is. Right. And I think something in, in conjunction with what you just said, uh, Sachin Waman has asked, I really like the paradigm of leaving the home in search of receiving. Could you please talk a little more on when is the right in one's lifetime to leave the right time, it means, in one's lifetime to leave the mode of serving to explore the pleasure of receiving. No, it, it's not in sequence. It is simultaneous. You can only serve best if you are capable of receiving without embarrassment. And what do you receive? You don't receive great riches. It can be a glass of water. 
and you're walking and feel thirsty and you stop at a house and say, you know, do this and they give you water. And that is something you received. And that receiving and giving are the same spirit. It says, everything belongs between us. Everything that is there is in the commons. And the commons we use carefully because you will need it and I will also need it. And we don't do, uh, you know, uh, uh, irresponsible actions in the commons. So to hold the world in the commons means receiving without embarrassment and giving without restraint. Uh, this is in all our stories that uh, the couple who gave their child you know, this God comes and says, I want to eat your child. And they cook it and give it to, and then they get, of course, moksha and all that. What, what is the meaning of that story? That is, the meaning is that sharing. And this is not only in, in, in Hindu culture. You see it in Islam. You see it in Christianity. You see it in every single sensitive human uh, and you see it, you go anywhere in Africa and they'll give you food. You go to Australia, they'll do the same. And nowhere in the world I have seen that people say, no, no, you pay for it, otherwise not. Yeah? Lovely, lovely thought. Uh, actually, uh, what, uh, when you, talk in, you were talking, I, I got reminded of uh, one of my colleagues' experience of uh, the Narmada Parikrama. Uh, while she was uh, on it uh, last year, uh, while she was moving around and uh, she was at a point where she thought she has too much of baggage with her and she would not want to carry too much of food or the donations that came because it would increase the weight and tire her down while she walked to another location. So she didn't carry the food, but after about half the journey, she realized that she's hungry and suddenly out of nowhere, this hospitality part comes in. A, a man walks up to her, gives her some bananas and says, uh, I know the journey is long and there is nothing to eat on the way ahead. So please have this. So he emerges out of uh, this, out of nowhere. Mm. And I, I think what you explained uh, beautifully relates to it because between these two destinations, this journey is what that defines uh, the way you look at architecture. It doesn't have to be built space. And I think you made that point at the start of your talk. Mm. Uh, Sudhir Menon mentions... Uh, such elegance of thought uh, and art articulation, sir. Uh, thank you for elevating architecture to a different level. And I think this is what is very important as designers. We have to be contributing uh, so much uh, for this uh, thought of uh, hospitality or camaraderie or people to people connection. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, uh, sir, for such wonderful thoughts. Uh, could we have some parting words from you on this so that uh, it's a fitting end to this uh, e beautiful evening? Yeah. I think that uh, whatever we build, we build, we should build with the spirit of inquiry and with the spirit, spirit of trying to reach the core of the matter. Because that is what the pilgrim is wanting to do. Why does he want to go to the Tirtha? Because that he feels that place, he will be able to jump across the river. That is why it is called the Tirth. And so, even in doing architecture, we look for the way in which we transcend what is the beginning point. The beginning point has to be understood fully and investigated. But the pilgrim will say, yes, this is part of the journey and these are the necessities to which this architecture answers. But when it is answered well, then it becomes architecture. And without it, it simply becomes building. And I think this is because I would not like to leave the impression that one is only talking about uh, the spirit of man one is also talking about architecture in the same sentence, both these two things can exist. And this is where I think we can really make a difference to how we work in the world. So I hope that all of you will get 
opportunities to do this. You will find the opportunities and you will passionately follow in whatever diverse ways, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, the work of being the pilgrim on earth, the real pilgrim. Lovely. So we we'll look forward to this symbiotic existence and uh, I think it will be a wonderful uh, way, uh, journey to explore. Thank you so much, uh, Chaya, sir. It's been a wonderful evening and uh, the talk has uh, mesmerized all of us and I'm sure the learnings will take it forward. Uh, so thank you so much. And this, this is to the audience, uh, day after tomorrow, uh, our third jury member uh, is going to be presenting at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, same uh, uh, the credentials are available on our website as well as our Instagram handle. And please tune in on uh, 24th, 10 a.m. onwards for listening to more insights from Chaya sir on the entries of the uh, competition, the shortlisted entries. And the other jury members will also be contributing their uh, voices to it. So thank you very much. Have a good evening ahead. All of you stay safe. And thank you, Chaya sir. And see you day after tomorrow again on 24th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.